don't go away There's so much that needs to grow today Rain, rain, please don't go away I love H2O Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Master Rain Gardener Certification class. This is where we will teach you to design your own rain garden. By the end of our five-part series, you'll have a rain garden all planned out for your very own yard. This is Susan Bryan with Washtenaw County Water Resources Commissioner's Office. With me is Shannon Gibb Randall, Principal of Insight Design Studio here in Ann Arbor Mission. Hi Shannon. Hi Susan, how are you? I'm good, how are you today? I'm doing fine. That's great. That's great. All right. Also with me today are Katie Wytacek, our water quality specialist here at the county, and Leslie Kelman, Master Rain Gardener alumni here to tell her story. So this is class four, planting design, because there are a lot of plants to choose from in the world. And these are selecting the plants for your garden that will grow and thrive. Next class. Um, we'll be workshopping some of your finished designs, and I'm really excited about seeing them. This is the fun part of the class for me. You, are, you all are doing the hard work, and I get to see um, your, your results. All the classes, of course, have plants of the day. Today, we're focusing on plants for sun, so if you have a sunny garden, and alumni tell how they did it today, Leslie Kelman. Okay, the joke of the day. Real gardeners buy at least 10,000 plants over the course of a lifetime without having any idea where they'll put them once they get home, which is, this is true. Um, true. So, that's right. <laughs> that's right. There's no, um, Leslie's joining in and saying this is very true. Um, you're not actually not a real gardener until you've done this. Um, but having a plan will give you sort of the framework within which when you buy those, you know, unexpected treasures, you'll be able to put them within that um, garden and they'll be, you know, they'll be a supporting player to your main stars. So how, okay, so today, uh, we're, Shannon's going to start out with taking a step back and giving us a little more thoughtful, philosophical, how to begin, what to think about when you're choosing plants. Um, and then I will talk about lifestyle like what is your lifestyle therefore what plants should you choose and in general I'm just gonna say that um, if you want to think about choosing your plants and take some time with it you should listen to Ch Shannon and if you want to just cut to the chase you should listen to me <laughs> so those are our different perspectives also we're going to have Leslie Kelman come in and talk about the story of her rain garden um, I'm going to go over just a few of the plants that you suggested in your homework that we have not talked about, so just to something for totally different. And uh, then Shannon will talk about designing for the yard. And this is really the nuts and bolts, step by step, right plant, right place kind of an analysis. Uh, our plants of the day are for a sun garden. And then we'll talk about the homework. All right, so all of our plant suggestions, don't feel like you have to like write down every single Latin name as we're going through them. The, I sent you a link, and you can, and I'll send you it again this week, the link to our vetted plant list. So this is a plant list um, that are, of plants that are appropriate for rain gardens, and not just every single plant for rain gardens that you can find on the internet. These plants have been tested by homeowners in our program, and not only did these plants thrive, in a rain garden, but they also, the homeowners liked them. They, you know, they didn't think they looked ratty and awful. These are the ones that people thought looked great. So in some ways, you, if you just pick the right light level and the right height, it's hard to go wrong. Also in this uh, sheet, we have all sorts of information that makes it easy for you to kind of narrow down your choices, which is the height. Is it deer resistance? If you have a lot of deer in your neighborhood, you're going to need to select for that. Um, and just, you know, other informa information that might be good, like what color the flowers, what time of year does it bloom, what kind of habitat that it provides, those sorts of things. It also will include our unedited opinions about these plants and what they're good for, what they're not good for, maybe what their strengths are, because some plants are stars of the show in a garden and some are supporting players. So what function that that plant might have. We also have the top 20 and really you could pick from these and you would have a perfectly fine beautiful garden um, but you know these already because we've been going over them in Plants of the Day. All right so uh, Shannon will take us through as as a professional who does this every day 
Um, <laughs> how does she begin? You know, how do, what is her thought process at the very beginning when she's picking plants for a particular garden? So the proverbial blank page. It's hard to figure out how to start this. You know, you have your you have your base map and all that sort of thing, but the whole planting plan piece can feel really overwhelming. So I'm going to give you a couple of options for starting points of ways to get into thinking about this. And you may already have a whole bunch of ideas, but for those of you that are kind of staring at the blank page, this might give you um, a couple of strategies to figure out how to even start thinking about calling that huge list down to something that feels manageable for your plan. So this is going to come totally out of left field, but one thing to think about is what is it going to look like in the winter? Because the sad truth is that we are looking at it in its dormant state for a decent amount of the year. So now this also may depend on where your rain garden is. Is this something you're going to see in the winter? If it's like in your front yard, then you probably are. It may be in a place where you are really only there in the summertime. Um, and so it doesn't, doesn't matter as much. But for those of you that will be seeing it in the winter, think about shrubs. Think about ornamental grasses, ones that stay up in the wintertime, so that you can have some structure. Not only you know, are, do these provide structure in the summer as well, but they really give it some stature and some architecture. And so that's a, a one way to begin is to think, OK, where do I want some shrubs or where do I want some grasses um, uh, or things that have really strong seed heads? And we'll go over a few of those too. So uh, and there's even, you know, standing dead, you can see in the in this photograph of the green roof that is looking down on the um, Ann Arbor City Hall where this picture was taken, where we did this rain garden design. You can see the little seed heads of allium that are poking up through the snow there. So even some of these little perennials can um, can still have some interesting uh, form and texture in the wintertime. Yeah. I'm the, I was giggling at the standing dead um, because oh. we're, not, we're not talking zombies. <laughs> we're not talking zombies. That's right. <laughs> but standing dead plan. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> the standing dead. <laughs> All righty. So um, next slide is thinking about how leaf texture could also be something that you could use. Here you see a um, in the kind of center that strappy foliage, that's the blue flag iris uh, that's moving through there. That's um, kind of the wetter part of the rain garden. And on the other side of that, uh, the kind of more yellowy green piece, that's obedient plant. And then next to that is wild strawberry. So you can see those, nothing's blooming in this picture, but you can kind of see what's going on almost. You can sort of see the edge of that rain garden that way. Massing can really help bring these leaf texture things out. So that's something to um, think about too with the leaf texture is, is um, grouping plants and more than just um, kind of isolated, you know, individuals, but um, thinking about them as a larger, as a larger um, clump. So another one here, this is actually from my rain garden. Um, this is uh, iris and wild ginger and early meadow rue and um, and then you see some sedge um, in there too. They all have really different leaf textures. This my garden barely blooms actually because it's in a really dark place um, but I love all the texture pieces in it so um, and these stick around, texture sticks around all summer long so that's the other nice thing about organizing around something like that is that um, it may not look the super showiest in terms of the big flowers and things like that but um, it looks good all year so that or, or at least all the growing season so that's another thing to think about as a way in. Another uh, way in is to use leaf color contrast. We've gone over a few of the, um, plants that have that are cultivars of native plants, things that breeders have developed that have different colored foliage. So um, you often see chartreuse colored ones like here with the tiger eye sumac or um, sometimes purpley leaved things. And that can be a real way to carry your eye through um, uh, through a planting. So in this photo you see this is a rain garden that we did for um, 
a, a big downtown development in Ann Arbor where uh, you see Fox Edge in front of the Tiger Eye Sumac and you see some very young uh, red twig dogwood that are up in the front um, and then you have some cedars behind which really make that sumac pop out like that chartreuse really comes out with that and something that was completely unintended that I had no idea that I was actually doing this until I saw the the happy circumstance at the end was in the very background there's this super super tall plant because we have like a nine foot concrete wall uh, behind this that I wanted to be able to screen is helianthus lemon queen which has this really cool clear yellow flower that ended up picking up the chartreuse color of the tiger eyes so sometimes those um, even the the leaf color can end up picking up on the flower color too but that leaf color contrast again looks good all season you know all the growing seasons so that's a an, another way to think about um, beginning and organizing your plants Another one is fall, thinking about fall. Here you've got some really interesting, more the, the standing dead zombie plants that I was talking about earlier. Um, you can see the purple coneflower, which is the really black um, groups there that have those uh, little globe-like seed heads that are all beautifully co um, covered in frost. And those will actually really stay up through the winter, um, certainly in the fall. And the other cool thing in the fall is that the um, a little earlier than this part in the fall, the goldfinches are all over them, all over them. They're pulling out those seeds. So that's another fun fun thing about that. But you can just see here how the grasses contrast so beautifully with the other standing dead of the um, perennials in through here. So um, fall can be a really wonderful time to think about um, how you're contrasting things as well. So the, the more kind of classic way to begin also is thinking about color combinations of your flowers. So we're going to go over a few that, um, that uh, have been some uh, popular ones. Um, and this one is a swamp milkweed and tall bellflower. You can see the blue there, the spikes. Uh, blue spikes and culver's root, which are the white spikes. Um, this is all pretty tall, so probably this is in the four foot range or something, so you might want to have this be, have something shorter in front of it, but they're all blooming at the same time and quite lovely. This is actually in a shadier spot, believe it or not, too, because that swamp milkweed will take um, uh, part shade pretty easily. So that's a nice combo. Uh, Susan, this is one that you uh, figured out. So why don't you talk about um, this combination? Sure. Uh, this is on Miller Avenue in Western uh, Ann Arbor. And, uh, you know, I think I actually originally, there's a lot of happy circumstance that happens um, when you're <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> you plant I'm not sure we actually think about this beforehand. Right. Um, but, but this is the Shenandoah switchgrass. It's a cultivar of the native switchgrass. And it has this pinky color when it's seeding and flowering. And then next to the native rose mallow, uh, hibiscus moschutos, and you can really see that it's a hibiscus with those beautiful flowers. Those pinks really play off each other, and one is really misty at the same time that the other one's huge, um, big pink flowers. And that I, I really like this combination. And the texture contrast is, that's partly what you're describing too, is so great with those big coarse leaves and those big huge flowers and then the kind of diaphanous um, grasses like that. And it's really beautiful together. Yeah. Another combination. So um, uh, this is uh, Black Eyed Susan with Bee Balm, which is the lighter purple in the upper left and uh, Blue Vervain, which is the darker purple in the upper right. And um, so this is the kind of yellows and purples playing off of each other. Um, so I really, Bee Balm is a great plant to use in a rain garden habitat wise. It just draws all kinds of critters um, and it, the, the bees are just, it, it is aptly named Bee Balm because the bees are all over it. It's really fun to watch. Um, it has a very light lavender color, and so I find with the kind of more warm gold color of the Black Eyed Susan that the, um, the bee balm can look a little washed out, but by adding that deeper purple, somehow that base note kind of brings it all um, into focus and really, uh, I think, makes it all sing together. So um, that's me being super picky about color combinations because that's 
what I like to think about. Um, but that is a way to kind of think about playing off that color wheel of opposite colors, like yellow and purple and uh, blue and orange and green and red. Um, so that's something that can be really eye-popping. The other thing to keep in mind with this is that, you know, once this one is done, then it's done. <laughs> There's not a whole lot going on in there besides that. So thinking about sequence is another, another piece to add into to things as well. That's right. This was, the photo was taken at the correct time. That, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> there are many photos like that. I, I, I see around. It's like, huh? What's it gonna? What's that gonna look like in a month? Um, so here's another one that we would like people to try because we think it would be super fun. Um, and that is Liatris um, spicata cobold, which is again a cultivated version of a native plant. A little shorter. A little. Uh, um, more florific, uh, and then the nodding wild onion, which is also a really light, light lavender, um, not quite white, not quite pink, not quite purple, but somehow when you put it with the purple, then it uh, it really brings out the little base notes of the purple in it. And here I saw, um, I actually saw it in somebody's extension between the sidewalk and the road with the onion, um, the, the allium together with the liatris. This one is actually a cultivated allium, I can tell, but it still has that same super light lavender and looks really pretty. The form difference is really pretty too with the little globes and then the spikes together. So um, we'd love to see somebody try the nodding wild onion with the liatris because they're their leaf textures are so similar, it'd be really pretty to plant them um, kind of all intermixed together. And we'd love to see photos, actually. Totally. <laughs> Please, <laughs> share. <laughs> Please share. Please yes. share. Yep. Here's another one that I love together, which is um, purple cone flower. Um, which is the one with the kind of orangey center that looks sort of daisy-like. And then Joe Pieweed, which is in the background, super tall, and Culver's Root. And one of the reasons I love this combination is um, the forms of the, of the two pink flowers are really, really different from each other, but they have that same color at the same, at the same time, so they, um, they it feels very integrated somehow to me when I see that together. Um, and it just kind of it, it snaps together and really works. So it can be fun um, to not just play with the kind of opposites on the color wheel, but also look at the same colors but with really different uh, flower forms. So that that can be really fun to try. That's a beautiful combination. And uh, that was part of people's homework too. So it's a good way to start actually. It's just yeah. to pick two. That you yep. have some reason that they go together and then build from there. Yep. In some ways, um, when we get to some of, uh, like Leslie's plant list, it's going to be this really long list. But really, you only need like six. Six plants. Yep. That's that's all you need. So keep that in mind. You don't have to like, you know, winnow down the whole list. Just pick, you know, a few and start there. Yeah. Okay. So um, cutting to the chase, if you... Um, have particular constraints on your time or you have other things to do or um, uh, maybe uh, yeah it's always sort of those constraints and maybe there's some plant palette that would be better for you it would just be a better fit for your lifestyle lifestyle can be a good lens with which to look at plant selection and then it really narrows down your choices because that's what we're trying to do so the first, I'm going to go through several categories of lifestyle. The first category is you have kids. And maybe you don't have kids yourself, but you're also, you're maybe just young at heart and you love to observe and discover. So these are some plants that might be right for you. The first one is gray sedge, and I love its medieval mace-like seed head. And it's not pokey, so you know your kid's not going to like you know hurt their hand on this uh, seed head. But it's really interesting. I mean, it looks like the Death Star. It's so cool, and it's big. It's like an inch and a half across. Um, so it's something they would notice and pick. And you know, it actually in um, uh, a flower vase, this would also look really interesting with some with some more. Um, traditional flowers. So that's one. Um, things that with unexpected characteristics I think are really good for kids. We've also we've already talked about milkweeds. There's not just swamp milkweed which we've talked about. There's also butterfly milkweed, common milkweed, world milkweed, there's a purple milkweed. There's a lot of them and they're all good uh, hosts for the monarch butterfly. So if you want to support their migration. Also this is the stuff of childhood, you know, the fluff that blows away in the fall. But did you not know that you can also, in order to like plant, if you want to plant some of those seeds in your yard, it's difficult because they fly away because they're all fluffy. 
Um, but if you want to get rid of the fluff, a good way to do is put a bunch in a fireproof pan and light them on fire. And they'll just go up in flames like this and then it's gone. It's just a moment of moment in time when they're burning. Um, you want to make sure to be safe. Like, Don't do it under your power lines, things like that. Um, and do it outside. Uh, but um, it's super fun and look at how excited that child is. Oh my goodness, they had a, we had a good time that day. And then after you clean them, you can uh, put them in potting soil and grow them and they're really easy to germinate so you'll get lots of little seedlings and it's just so much fun to see a seed grow like through a child's eyes. Another thing to grow are oak uh, acorns and they will germinate very easily and they're big so you can really see all the parts and observe them as they grow. So that's another fun thing and then you can put it in your rain garden. Something that people are really interested in these days are edible landscapes, things that you can eat out of your garden that are perennial. Um, you can do that in a rain garden if, and this is a big if, you test the water that's going into the rain garden. So you can, um, in our county, you can bring it to the county and we'll test your water. Usually it's the county um, that will test your water and it just needs to pass the criteria for irrigation. Not drinking, you're not drinking this water, but it has to pass the test for irrigation. One of the plants that you can eat the berries of are wild strawberry, and they are just like the store-bought strawberries, but tiny and delicious, just absolutely tasty. Another one that I like to eat, actually, in the spring are service berry, sit berries, and they taste a little bit like blueberries, but a little less acid, more mild, um, and they're good to eat right out of hand. You don't have to cook anything with them, like with elderberries, which is another good rain garden plant that um, is also edible, but you have to make wine or jelly or jam or something out of. Putting rocks in your rain garden is a great way to attract kids. Kids love those little stepping stones through your rain garden. And also it's handy for us as you know people who are going to weed this rain garden too. It gives us somewhere to walk. Okay, so another lifestyle is maybe you don't have much time for gardening for whatever reason. And it could be because you have kids. It could be because gardening is not your hobby. You have other things to do. Uh, so, it, or any situation where this garden is not going to get weeded all the time, like it's way in the back 40, something like that. A good thing to do is to plant a plant that spreads, like any of these three, Canada anemone, obedient plant, wild strawberry, they will take over an area. They will go over and rampage over other plants. So keep that in mind. If you want space in between your plants and you plan to keep it that way, don't plant these plants. They will drive you crazy. Um, but if you're really looking for something that's very low maintenance and that will cover the area so there are no weeds, these are the plants for you. Another really low maintenance, not that it's so low maintenance um, per se, is to um, plant shrubs. And the reason why it's low maintenance is because it's delegatable. If you have a bed with a bunch of shrubs and maybe ground cover or maybe just mulch, you can tell a, a teenager or a landscape company go weed that bed and they'll know what to pull, whereas a perennial bed is a little more complicated. So here's cinquefoil goldfinger, also known as Potentia fruticosa, which is a very short uh, shrub that um, blooms all summer with those yellow flowers. Summer sweet clethra smells really nice, which is nice. It's a little bigger, about four feet tall. Elderberry is another one that you see in the ditches all over Michigan. And it comes in some pretty colors like Shannon was talking about. Black lace is dark purple. Lemony lace is chartreuse, light green. Nine bark also comes in a dark purple and is a good shrub for a rain garden. Okay, so another way to sort of simplify uh, this down so it would be easier to maintain is to just have trees and ground cover. And this is a little hard to pull off because that tree and that one plant that you picked has to survive in the wettest part of the rain garden, the driest part of the rain garden, you know, everything in between. So there's really only a couple ground covers that we think would be able to pull it off. Um, one of them is this one, Fox Edge. And then I'll get to the next slide and show you the other two. But as also as you're picking your um, your your trees, some of them do wetter, better in wet, some do better in dryish. So I have the list over there on the right organized that way. From the very wettest, uh, river birch will take a lot of wet all the way down to bitternuts, hickory. Also, start your trees small. You don't want to put in a three-inch caliper tree in a rain garden just because it's not used to that hydrology yet. Start them small and let them grow up and you'll have more success. 
Hey, Susan. Yeah. One other thing um, I just wanted to break in about with the trees um, is that the wet to dry-ish thing is really dependent on what your um, what your uh, percolation rate was. Mm -hmm. So if you held water for a long time, then maybe river birch is your answer. But if you were pretty sandy, it went you know it went fast, then you have more options on the drier side. So that's really what you're looking at there is uh, that in relation to what your your soils your perk rate was. Yeah, yeah, good good point. And that yeah that makes it easy, right? Yep. Um, so only, then there are probably more, but the only ones that we could think of that would do well in, you know, anywhere in this whole basin of rain garden would be blue flag iris and daylilies. Daylilies are not native, um, but there's a lot of cultivars to choose from. So you don't get the habitat when you get non-natives. All right, so some people, like my garden is, I have a very small garden, and it's an urban space. It's tiny, and for a tiny garden, you need tiny plants. This is a lesson I learned the hard way, actually. <laughs> um, red baneberry has beautiful red berries right now. Swamp buttercup is has ye these yellow flowers in the spring. Really, really nice short plant. And Virginia water leaf has blooms in spring, and it's just beautiful. It will take all the way from dry shade all the way to rain garden wet. We've also already talked about nodding wild onion and wild geranium. So if you have a tiny rain garden in a tiny space, use some of these tiny plants. Okay, so next up is um, to tell the story of building her rain garden is Leslie Kelman, and uh, she, um, Leslie, I love your, um, the, we, we asked what the theme was going to be for your garden. You said, picking plants that make you happy, and I love that. Um, <laughs> that's really the theme of this whole class, actually. Okay, um, and that's, that's what I've done. Um, right here, what you see, this is this is actually from the tour from a couple of weeks ago. And just to pick up on some of the things that you've already mentioned, this is the front rain garden right here. And don't look at the berm, we're still working on that. Um, but this one, because <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> off right. to the left, <laughs> off to the left, off kind of off screen, you've got some shrubs and then the garage, which is on a slab, so we don't worry about too much about the 10-foot rule there. But here, because it's in front, I did use a lot of shrubs and the shorter cultivars of the shrubs. So we've got summer sweet in there, um, sweet spire in there. Um, some Japanese spirea off camera there is some of that potentia and that so there I chose shrubs and then I've got a few other things in front to hide when they look kind of sad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very big on hiding things. Okay so the rain garden that I did for the class is what you can kind of see right here and backing up so it would be like in the lower left that is the side of the house. It's the east side. Um, water runs in because water runs down towards the house in there. Off on the upper left and towards the right are my back neighbors and my side neighbors. And I am down slope from both of those. And believe me, I didn't need a perk test, although I did do one, to tell me I've got a lot of clay there. And so in May, you can't walk in there without boots. And so I decided I was going to take an existing garden and expand it. And so you can, if you can see the site here, um, Susan was just pointing. Oh, okay, there it is. Um, the part that she just drew in, that was an expansion. That was lawn. And then the part that was kind of the X line is part of an existing garden that I was going to just lift stuff up, lift plants up, dig down, and do that. Um, about at the far, about 20 feet from the downspout, which is the um, black dot there in the upper right of the house, and it was about 20 feet from there to the rain garden. And then on the other side, it's going to be about seven, eight feet from my neighbor. Okay, and as I mentioned, clay. Alrighty, so I went and killed killed the grass with the black plastic, which you can still see there right now. It's kind of holding the topsoil because I did want to hold on to that. And I've started digging. And if you see that light brown chunks, that's my clay. 
and I only had to go down a few inches to get to that. And it was so nice, dense, good old lake bed clay that I actually had to stand on my shovel, jump on my shovel to dig it um, when I wouldn't wait around for my husband to come home. Um, <laughs> and I actually kind of pounded it with that same heavy shovel and whatever I could find to break it up. It was that dense. And so. Yeah, I can see the um, clods. Yeah, so, so, serious clods. They are, and they have made their way throughout the yard because I didn't want to put all of it back. Um, right. <laughs> so it's been good infill. Okay, but as you can see here, it was pretty well at least, you know, first round dug. And I had decided to use the black flexible um, tubing because I wanted, to, well, I'm not really good at straight lines, um, but I thought if I had the flexible, I could you know adjust the length if I needed to. It'd be a lot easier than using PVC pipe, and also the PVC pipe I didn't think would work too well for me because when we did get a really good st strong storm, it would rush into the rain garden too quickly. That's also one of the reasons that I chose to use the pop-up emitter, which you can kind of see sitting about where it was going to end up. Um, and that was to help slow down the water so it wouldn't wash out the garden on those big storms. Uh, there isn't a lot of slope there. And so what I did, you can kind of make it out there. Um, I used a string level to make sure that it wasn't level, that I tried to get a bit of a down slope to it. To the pipe, right. To the pipe, um, to the emitter, to the garden, uh, because one of the reasons I put that rain garden there is also during those big storms, I got a little rain around the windows of the basement. And so I needed yeah. to get as much that water as quickly away from the house as I could. Right. So you were solving that um, water in your basement issue and building oh, a garden. Yeah. And, you know, another more place for plants, of course. Um, <laughs> Right. And you have, I think there's a bunch of compost in here, as any good gardener does, adding a lot of compost to a new bed. Um, where did you get that compost? Where, did you have it delivered or did you do bags? What was your... Um, let's see. A lot of it kind of hiding there is there is a compost bin. Um, so Later I use a lot from... Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some of that. The I really did kill that grass pretty well. <laughs> and so when I added back in, I added the topsoil that had the dead grass in it. Oh. Um, so that was another good source of organic material. Right. And my wonderful neighbor um, also ha collects all the leaves on the cul-de-sac, but mine. I won't let him pick up mine. Um, so I have some leaf piles, but I also use some of his. And I did go out and I did buy a couple bags of manure, and I think I did buy, ended up buying a couple bags of compost, but not a lot. And then I just kept adding it until it started looking that nice dark color as opposed to mm -hmm. that beige clay there. Right, so you were mixing mm -hmm. it together until it looked right. Yeah. Yeah, until yeah. it looked good. So, you know, how it's much like I did. <laughs> yeah. Mix it until it looks good. Yeah. yeah, looks good. Okay, there we go. And then here is my first test. It was not intentional. We just had a rain in the middle of it. And that's where I was able to see that the pop-up emitter does work. But off, like above the pop-up emitter there, that was supposed to be part of the rain garden, but that really wasn't collect. The water wasn't collecting there. It was still a little too high. Um, and so I did end up digging that down as well. Um, before I finally started doing the planting there. Right. So it was a good test. Okay, and here we are with the first part of the rain guard. Um, those nice big plants that you see there, um, those came from, some of them came out from elsewhere in the yard. That was one of my big things, was to start off with what I already have, if mm -hmm. that'll work, because yeah, I've got to be a little bit of a budget here. In fact, the Joe Pie, which is the one on the far upper left there that's in the pink bloom there, and the turtle head next to it, which is just getting ready to bloom, those I literally dug up, set on the tarp, dug down deep, and plopped them right back where they were. <laughs> right. So they didn't go far at all. Um, what was nice is I knew, I, well, to back up, when I, we bought the house about eight years ago, we clear cut everything because it was just so overgrown. And so I pretty much just filled in, which for those of you who did see the yard, 
that was me just fill 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 I like color 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 right so yeah. you know I've described you like it, flowers. It, yeah. I like flowers That's um, right. and my rain garden actually as you see the next few pictures is actually a little more subdued than the rest <laughs> of the yard um, okay but, here, but I won't say I went too subdued here because you can see that there are um, a few different plants here but basically I tried to keep with the shorter plants that could tolerate drier conditions along the berm and then as you head to the back of the rain garden which is on your right um, I went for some of the taller ones then off officially not in the rain garden but they still get some of the water um, are some taller shrubs that can also take shade because they're under my neighbor's cedars and can handle wetter conditions. The inkberry holly, for example, or the Michigan holly, and so on, and the spice bush. Okay, but since not everything that, you know, I had more space than plants I could move around, I had just had to, had to take a trip to wild type, and this was my car on the way home from wild type. That was not just um, my garden. There are a few other things in there, too, because, you know, I can't pass up a good deal, um, especially since I've been trying to go more native as the other stuff doesn't work. Okay, so here we are. Most everything's planted. Um, I like how they look so tiny when you first plant them. Oh, I mean, yeah. I just want to, like, when people plant their gardens, sometimes they plant them, and they're like, I need more plants. They're so tiny, but they oh, grow. Yeah. They grow. And you will see that in a, in a slide or two. Yeah, and this was also the first test, so the water did start collecting in the deeper end, um, right around the pop-up emitter. Uh, so I was pretty happy with that. And yeah, in the foreground is where there are, oh, hard yeah. to see, plugs. Uh, okay. <laughs> and it grew. <laughs> <laughs> this is the second summer. I mean, I planted those plants in, I, I took the same summer online class that you're taking right now. Mm -hmm. So those plants went in September, and this is the following beginning, end of July, beginning of August. And so that is just one year. Yeah. So things like the cardinal flower right there, those were some of those little plugs, the red one right there. The wild senna that's kind of the yellow flower up on top, that was another little plug. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, and so... Oh, the blue lobelia, which is that blue flower. Also, those were all little plugs. Like tiny, the, tiny September. Ones, yep. Yeah, <laughs> maybe six inches max. I think September is my favorite time to plant because then the next year you get these huge, beautiful plants that have a lot of roots, so they're just healthier. Yeah, they've had a lot of chance to develop the roots. Mm -hmm. Okay, same garden from a year ago, just looking towards the deck. And so here we've got the Joe Pie in bloom, the rose mallow. Um, there's some stout blue-eyed grass along the berm. It looks just kind of like a grass. Um, not too exciting there, but it has really pretty blue flowers in the spring. The blazing star, the liatris that Susan mentioned, and then there's some monkey flower in the foreground, which that year was maybe a foot tall. Um, this year, it's probably two, three feet tall. That's kidding. Getting... And it's got little tiny fine blue flowers. This is another angle, but then here's this year. Okay, yeah, and this is part of this year, so this is just about two years, and a little bit. We did we did end up expanding it a little bit um, because we expanded the food garden, and that also the other thing I had to do there was I had to redo the berm because the berm had too much clay in it. Um, plants, a lot of them didn't make it through the winter, and um, couldn't handle the you know for the dry, the drier conditions because the clay would crack expose the roots that open up. It was just not a bad thing. So when I ended up expanding the garden, I ended up redoing the berm. And, and then you added, added more compost. Is that what you did to make compost, that? Especially um, where the plants were actually going to be dug. So they would at least get, they were mixed in with clay and compost there. So they would take off. And as you can see, they're doing a lot better. <laughs> it's beautiful. It just looks so gorgeous. And then okay, here's and yeah, when you're here, it is when you're facing again and again. This is just from a couple of weeks ago, so it was in between the tour and now. Um, for those of you who saw it, and I'm very happy. Things things are growing; they're looking good. And what I like is 
I really do get from early spring until late fall. Something's always blooming. Uh -huh. That's fun. And that's what I like. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, too, to see the different styles. Like, Shannon, uh, I think, goes for, like, peaceful, meditative. Mm -hmm. And yours is so exciting because you have all <laughs> these different colors and all these things going on. It's nice to see. I mean, different people like different things. And uh, yeah. you planted what you, made you happy. So that's... Exactly. And, you know, to me, this is actually more subdued than some of the rest of the yard. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you have big, huge... Yeah, you have beautiful yeah. things in the rest of your yard as well. But yeah, it's yeah. fun because I like sitting out there now in the evening and just watching the butterflies, the birds, the mountain mint, which really didn't show up on these, um, off in one corner. I was walking by one day and counted six different species of bees. So it's fun, and it's fun watching that. It I sure couldn't is. tell you what bees. Or one of my favorites, um, and you can listen on here, the bottle gentian. That hasn't started blooming yet. But watching the bumblebees. Um, kind of wiggle their way in there because the bottle gentian is a blue flower that'll stay closed, and the only th I think the only thing that gets into it is a bumblebee. And watching that little bumblebee wiggle into that flower <laughs> just makes me giggle. <laughs> All right. Well, if your garden's making you giggle, then then you did a good job. Thank you so much for telling your story of your rain garden, Leslie. Okay. Um, so next we're going to talk about a couple of plants that um, Karen Cruz suggested just to because she has suggested things that we have not talked about in class so let's just you know react to them and see what we think. Um, she had a couple different spots she's thinking about and she hasn't actually decided I don't think. Here's something that she was thinking about for the dry part behind the rain garden and I thought I think this is really fun Russian sage which loves dry blazing sun and uh, Rose of Sharon. Those look not, actually. I've never thought about planting those together, and yeah, I, like I think that's a cool. Yeah, I think that's a really nice combination. It's kind of like that those same color, different form thing idea next to each other. Um, yeah. And they're also again sort of blooming at a time of year when there's not a lot going on. So it's really nice to be able to have a pop of something that looks really nice together um, yeah. during that sort of dry stretch that we're all in right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. right it's now not, when it's dry. yeah, like right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next color, color combination, and this is in the rain garden, this would be fine. Both of these plants I think would do great. Are She said Shasta Daisy plus a couple of colors of coneflowers, and I wasn't sure if she meant, like there's echinacea cultivars which have um, a, few, a bunch of different colors. They're all sorts yeah. of colors these days. Um, or if she meant gray-headed coneflower, which is yellow. And I think either way, I think it'd be lovely. Yeah. So the other thing, just to um, a, a resource that I haven't mentioned that can be really helpful um, to look at is uh, something called Garden Web, which is now I think hosted by House actually. Yeah, and that's and, one of the forums we're using for class. So yeah. Yeah. So they like I remember uh, what I will often do if I don't know a plant or I don't know a cultivar of a plant, I'll type it in and and do Garden Web. And like you know, Shasta Daisy and Garden Web, and then um, I'll get all these strings of conversations that people have had uh, about it. And so I learned a ton about some of the echinacea cultivars actually from that uh, forum there, because there is a billion cultivars <laughs> of coneflower out there right now. Some of them are completely bizarre. I mean, it's like it's so interesting to see uh, you know all of the. Um, um, genetic breeding that's going on with that but some of them don't last more than a year so before you go crazy with the echinacea I would try uh, typing that one in and, and seeing which ones you're interested in using because there's some that just totally perform and there's some people say yeah well that lasted for a year and by the second year it was tiny and then it was gone by the third year so um, as you're testing things garden web is a really good resource um, to look for the other thing with the Shasta daisy is its heritage is not wet um, so I would not put that in the bottom of your rain garden. That's unless, a good point. It's in mine, but I have a sandy rain you garden. You have a sandy yeah. rain garden. That's right. So I think yeah. that that really depends on what your uh, percolation rate was. So if you're sandy, then you're probably fine. If you're, if it was really wet, then I'd put it closer to the berm, um, because I think that it is. Uh, it, it's. It doesn't come from a wet place in terms of where I looked that one up quickly before class to see, and and it's it's um, it's a drier. It's a drier plant, so. All right. Um, okay. So next, we're going to talk about what are sort of the step-by-step -step right plant, right place. What are all the things that when you're thinking about designing besides plant combinations, um, 
Shannon, would you mind going through some of that? Designing for your yard, what are all the yeah. things to think about? Yeah. So let's think about the function of what we're talking about here. One is, you know, we're talking about the function of plants here. And so the idea is that they're going to absorb rainwater and handle um, the standing water that's there, right? So they've got to be able to handle wet at the same time they have to be able to, um, oh, and, oh, for, sorry, you're right, Susan, I skipped something. It is not a wetland. It is not water that sticks around forever. Those have really different class of plants, um, pond lilies and things like that. Uh, so um, it is not meant to, it's not, uh, it's not a pond planting. It can handle the standing water, but then at the same time, it can also handle the drought. And uh, that's what we're seeing right now, right? Uh, so can can your, can your rain garden plants handle what's happening right now, um, at least in our part of the state? So that's a tough combination. I mean, that's not so easy, right? To be able to handle six inches of ponding water and then also handle huge stretches of dry. That's kind of a, a you know a narrow band of plants that will handle that. So that's a big job that they're doing. That's the the function of these plants is you know wet and dry. The other function of the plants is that is to look good. So rain gardens, I think everyone would agree, are environmentally sustainable, but they also have to be culturally sustainable. People have to like them because if they don't, then they will get mowed down um, or they will get filled in. And so uh, really think about you know it looking good because um, it's doing this job for you. It's like a utility basically, but it also needs to be um, pleasing to people as well. So weeding is part of the job. So it's the the aesthetic and cultural needs mean that you have to take care of it. And somewhere down the line in the early years of the kind of native plant thing, this idea got out that it was no maintenance. And that is a complete and total lie. I want you to just erase that from your mind because it is <laughs> not true at all. The thing that it 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 means you don't have to like you know, spray for Japanese beetles or acidify the soil like you do with a bunch of other kind of fussy garden plants. But if you have a rain garden, weeding is part of the job. And this is one of those um, places that I designed years ago. You can see its first year of growth on the left. Everything just looks neat and nice and great. And then 10 years later, that's the picture on the right is the same spot. And it just became a, a weedy, awful nightmare. So it really, it gets away from you, things start to reseed, and then the crabgrass gets in there, and it's just like one thing after another. Thankfully, this has a, a nice, happy ending. Um, uh, we were able to actually rip out everything and start over. This is at Mouse Creek Library, and so they let us um, kind of take it on again, and we got them the right people to maintain it um, this time, so happily, it's uh, looking a lot better. So I think Susan, there's a photo in there. Is oh well, yeah, there do oh, yes. we do have a photo because take you know planting a garden. It's not like buying a new chair for your dining room. It's like getting a puppy. Yeah, you have to feed it every day. <laughs> a garden yeah. is the same way. Like it's so nice to have a garden that you just walk by every day and you pick that one weed and it's no big deal as long as you do that every day. You're fine. But once it gets away from you, ugh, it's awful. It's hard, and it's I do have a photo of, of that garden now and it's looking beautiful. Yeah, yeah, and you can see how big those trees have gotten and everything too, because now it's, you know, it's probably 12 or 13 years old, I think, um, in terms mm -hmm. of those trees. So that's lemony lace uh, elderberry in the front there, so um, you can see how nicely that kind of pops out. So yes, it's never too late, that's right. <laughs> it's <laughs> never too late. Went in and you can always redo it. <laughs> that's the nice thing about gardening in general, is you can, you know, you can redo, you can modify as you yeah. go along. It's not a yeah. done deal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the other function is creating habitat, and that is one of the wonderful things about using um, natives is that um, you're going to be amazed who starts to show up in your garden. Even in like tiny urban gardens, you have creatures that start to figure out that you're there, and little goldfinches will arrive, or butterflies, or bumblebees, um, and toads, and things like that. So it's really fun to be able to watch all of that happen. It's like what Leslie was talking about um, uh, with all the creatures that are there. Uh, so uh, there's a really wonderful resource for this, um, Wild Type Plants, which is where we're going to be going on um, one of the field trips. On their website, they have uh, a great link that tells you um, 
butterflies associations with the plants that they sell. So it's it's a great list of um, who is a host and you know who lays eggs on it and who eats it and all that sort of stuff. So it's really um, it's a it's a great uh, link. You should check it out if you're interested in the habitat piece. So the other function is that the plants have to grow, right? So you have to pick the right plant for the right place. So you can't put wild ginger in the blazing sun, right? So you can't, you know, put um, Russian sage in the bottom of your rain garden, <laughs> you know? So you have to figure out, you know, what's that you're supporting that plant. You're trying to create the conditions, um, the best conditions for it to grow. So you have to do a little research to make sure that you've got the right conditions um, uh, to be able to work in your particular situation. So the other thing is environmental conditions, and that's what I'm kind of getting at here. So in order to grow and thrive, you have to understand the sun patterns on your site, sun, parts, sun, shade, the soils, and really the big dimension that we're talking about is the clay versus sand. Um, and, uh, you know, once you dug your hole, you probably have some sense of that because that, that'll tell you uh, pretty quickly which, which direction you're in. And, the, um, and then the perk rate, right, the hydrology, how wet is it going to get? And that depends on your soils. It depends on your sizing because last week we talked about, well, you know, maybe you don't have time or the space to do a, a garden that's 20% of your roof size and you want to make it smaller. That's fine. What you have to realize is that it'll fill up faster. And so that means you may need to pick plants that are on the wetter side of things. Um, or the depth is also related to that too. So if you do like the three inch versus six inch, um, you know, if it's six inches and you've got to pick the plants that can handle that, especially if you undersize it, then you're talking about iris and swamp milkweed and some of the sedges and things like that to be able to handle that kind of condition. So sun, soils, and hydrology, those environmental conditions are really important in order to choose right plant, right place. The other piece are visual connections. So look at the context of your yard. And I, with, this is back in the program when we were doing um, all the design for the rain gardens before we started teaching the class. And I walked into this yard, he wanted a rain garden, and um, immediately I saw on the lower right, hey, there's a variegated red twig dogwood. Red twig dogwood would grow in a rain garden. And then way across there, that other yellow arrow pointing at a kind of nine bark, Diablo. So both those plants we put into his rain garden and what that does is help to kind of integrate the feel of his, of his yard. So those visual connections can be really powerful. You can see that happening right here. Um, the rain garden is uh, uh, the one that the longer arrow is pointing to the rain garden, but they took some of those sedges and planted them in other areas too. So if you don't have a bunch of cues and connections to make in your yard, make them. Put some of those plants in other areas. Many of those rain garden plants will grow in perfectly normal soil too. So especially the ones that aren't like the super, super wet ones. So if you don't have them, make them. Uh, and then aesthetics. So this is the whole kind of wild to neat continuum. And uh, this is what I call prairie in your face. So this is the people that want to be like, out there and say this is our native landscape and I think that's awesome. Um, you have to understand uh, your neighborhood and your context and um, and in this neighborhood there's tons of people that have native plants so it's like hey go for it. In other neighborhoods the Kemlon set not so much maybe wouldn't like this so much so you need to figure out where you are in terms of the kind of um, the, the, the loose to neat continuum and here um, they've done uh, native plants in their yard that the road extension has daylilies in it, but you can see it has this neat lawn edge and the plants are shorter. Um, and so you just have to figure out where you are on that continuum. The other piece to think about is some people like to have a lot of space around their plants. They want to have mulch around their plants and have them just really read on their own. That's more weeding that way too, but some people really like that look. Or you can do more massing and um, put plants together and there's less weeding that way but you know it's again figuring out the look that you want. The other thing to think about is edging. So uh, it, 
depending, especially in the kind of lawn you have, some, some lawn grasses are more rhizomatous, meaning they put little runners underground and want to invade everywhere. Um, and it, it's nice to have an edge between, a landscape edge between your rain garden and your lawn. Um, so you can use the black plastic stuff, you can use aluminum edging, you can use this beautiful stone edging. However, I can guarantee that that person just put that in because it is completely weed free and you know what happens in two years that thing is going to have weedy stuff growing out of it and it's kind of harder to mow the lawn edge around it but it's really pretty so it's kind of as long as you go into that choice with your eyes open about what you're getting yourself into um, the stone edge can be really beautiful the other thing to think about is kind of how to um, control your views you don't necessarily have to see the rain garden all at once it's not just like a one-stop you know view spot you can think about maybe having lower plants but then a taller plant in the middle of it that you can't quite see what's on the other side and creating a little mystery can be really interesting so here is like I see that uh, grass that is um, sticking up there and I want to know like what's on the other side of that so there's that kind of bend in the path and that mystery um, which can really be fun to try to um, think about that kind of um, manipulating people's views so it feels like it's almost bigger than it is. The other plant that is awesome for this is uh, Millennia cerulea. It is not a native um, to here, but it's got these incredible um, seed heads on it that are really tall but very transparent, and they create this veil. And so you can kind of see through it, but not totally, and uh, that's a really neat one. And it has a wet heritage, so I think actually that would work really well in a rain garden. And then there's sometimes some things you don't really want to see, like the neighbor's AC unit over there sitting on some fu a funny platform. So you could put your rain garden in front of something like that to be able to control that view. So uh, rain gardens can be like a buffer for you too. So again, this garden context, you want to try to make it feel cohesive if you can. Um, this one, you can see like that is the rain garden and is completely different than everything around it. However, at the same time, some people want to say like, this is my rain garden and I'm going for contrast and I want it to be different than everything and that's totally justifiable too. Personally, for me, I like to be able to integrate it in. I think it just feels more calm and more restful. Um, so that's, that's more my approach, but I can totally see if you're coming from the, the high contrast um, justification side too. The other thing is thinking about a way through. How are you going to get through this? These people are kind of picking their way, trying to figure out how they're not stomping on plants. And so you want to think about circulation. And so there are several options for that through your rain garden because it's nice to be able to weed or just be able to walk through it. So there's a couple of different strategies we show here. One, this one has like a little boardwalky thing coming up to it, and then it just has a mulch path that goes through it. Another possibility is um, to be able to have stones. We did this at my uh, at my kids' rain garden at their school. We put in these big, huge flat stones, which would require equipment to do. Don't pick up that 2,000-pound stone on your own. Um, and uh, and it's above the ponding elevation of the garden, so kids like go through there even when it's full of water. It's really fun. Another option is a stump path. This is one that we did in a family housing area where we knew there were going to be a lot of kids and they're on this little strawberry island and then the, the stump path continues through the rest of the garden and the kids like to hop from stump to stump. I did that in my own garden and then I also realized that it was really helpful for me to perch on them for weeding so they can be kind of dual, uh, dual advantage there. Another option is, this is that same garden just from a different angle, is a lawn path. So it's two rain gardens that are connected by a pipe laid at the bottom so that the water can move back and forth between them. Um, and then the uh, soil is piled up on top and planted uh, with lawn. So that's another way to handle that. All right, um, so we are two plants of the day. So if you have a sun garden, you've been waiting for this the whole time. Um, the sun plants let's see so oh you know before we get into the plants of the day Shannon if you want to come back the, sure. um, we oftentimes will highlight native plants or we'll mention that a plant is native or non-native what's yeah. the deal with native plants like why even notice or why are native plants good 
So there's several reasons we are enthusiastic about native plants. One is that if you look at this root comparison chart and you see that little blob on the left, that's lawn at its happiest, happiest, happiest. It's five or six inches deep in terms of its roots. Then you look at some of these other roots of the native plants to the right of them, 15, 20 feet deep. And so those things are incredibly drought tolerant, pulling water up. Um, and I mean, it's just amazing the kind of work that they do. And so especially if you have heavy clay soils, man, those roots can break up clay like nobody's business. So it's really wonderful to use them for that water pumping capability. But then also, um, you know, it's part of our heritage. It's part of where we live and thinking about where we live. And we have part of the ecological heritage in southeastern Michigan are these areas of what they call Lake Plain Prairie. Um, and these are layers of soil that um, were laid down by glaciation and they can be kind of heavy clays and then sandy areas and stuff like that that are all layered on top of each other like a layer cake. And what happens is that you get this whole variety of plants that tap down into these different layers and depending on their hydrology and it's really interesting place because um, they can take these varying conditions of super drought and super wet and that's where a lot of the heritage of these um, Lake Plain prairie plants are actually many of them are rain garden plants because guess what they can take the dry and the wet too so um, that's part of our our whole the area where we live so it's neat to take some of these plants that were part of our heritage and bring them back you know and to use them and remind ourselves about the place where we are as compared to Arizona or Maine or California sometimes those things start to feel the same but when you start using native plants you're like hey this is this is where I live these are the plants of where I live yeah. I also love it when I have, um, I have a lot of natives in my garden and then when I go hiking in some yeah. natural area, then I see the plants that I know and I'm, oh, my friends, I know you. Yeah, so nice. exactly. <laughs> exactly. It is really great. And then there's all yeah. the habitat connections too. Mm -hmm. You know, your, sure. your, um, you know, all the insects that are here and like to go to those plants and stuff like that too. So and I love the gold finches in particular. I know they're so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, and cardinals. Oh. Yeah, it goes on and on. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Okay, plants of the day, all of which are none of all of which are native, but most of them are native today. Prairie dock is a wonderful native prairie plant that does great in rain gardens and it will do well even in the wettest part of the rain garden, but it also does well in very dry gardens. So this is a highly adaptable plant. I love it because it has those huge leaves, these massive leaves that almost look like a hosta or elephant ears or something like that. And when contrasted with a plant that is uh, like a grassy leaved plant, like here for instance, it's paired up with uh, prairie drop seed on the right, that like fluffy feathery grass that you see. And doesn't that look beautiful with a very huge leaf next to a very feathery leaf? Just really, really beautiful. Also, the leaves turn chocolate brown in the winter time, so they're really interesting, and they can look really good in front of uh, a background plant like prairie, um, like uh, switchgrass, because then you have light-colored black background, and then these chocolate-covered leaves in front. Really, really interesting. Also, um, the flower stalks get very tall, and this is my house. These are my prairie docks in front of my house, and you can see that my uh, neighbors are just very understanding because the the, the twelve foot stalks are leaning over their um, over their driveway. <laughs> and, uh, just learn from my mistakes. Um, the reason so this plant needs to be in the middle of the bed. It's not a good edge plant, um, which I you know learned here. Interestingly, the reason why they're on the edge is not because I planted them there on the edge, but because I tossed seeds. I got seeds from a seed swap, a wild one seed swap in February. I toss seeds into the rain garden on top of the snow and they germinated in the next spring and they grew, but they got washed down to the edge of the rain garden. So that's why seeds are a little bit more challenging when you put them in a rain garden. The second plant of the day is prairie uh, switchgrass, uh, which uh, is a tall, big prairie plant. It does well in full sun, absolutely all day sun. It loves it. It is tolerant to salt, so it's a good one if you're working with a parking lot. I know there's a couple of students who are working with parking lot runoff. Um, and 
you want to think about the, the straight species, the straight native species is a little bit floppier, it'll fall over a little bit more, and uh, it spreads more. Whereas the, cultiv the cultivated with, um, plants, the cultivars with uh, uh, quotation marks around their name, they don't spread, they just stay in their little clump. So keep that in mind. Great background to some, to some plants like red twig dogwood in front of this in the wintertime. How pretty is that? Or like I said, prairie duck. Um, the third plant of the day is Penstemon digitalis. This is a beautiful plant. It bloomed particularly well this year. Clear white flowers, gorgeous, and it's also blooming right in the late spring when hardly anything else is blooming. You know how that you have that excitement of early spring, and then there's a lull, and this blooms right in that lull. So just beautiful, and it will do well in the moist part of the garden or the dry. It has a great fall color. There's also a cultivar called Huskers Red that has this like uh, orangey, maroony color all year round. But the straight native has a gorgeous fall color. Baptisia blue false indigo is a centerpiece plant for full sun. It's a huge plant. It's five or six feet tall. And it will do well in the moist sides or the dry. It has these blue flowers, which are just very unusual. And the leaves are also kind of blue tinged. So putting it together with any kind of uh, bluey kind of flowers works really well. It also has these seed heads, which, you know, they're just weird looking, which is kind of interesting. Potentia fruticosa, we've talked about a little bit already. Very salt tolerant plant and just a very robust plant. It looks a little ratty sometimes when it gets a little older, but you can just cut it down to the ground and it will grow up fresh and be so happy. So trimming it back doesn't hurt it. And in fact, it loves it. This you might have seen in our field trip at Leslie's garden, uh, Rattlesnake Master, and it was an experimental plant for rain gardens, but enough people planted it and loved it, even though it's kind of a weird looking plant, uh, that we think it's accepted. Like we've, we've now accepted it into the pantheon of rain garden plants. I think Leslie planted it because Shannon said in last year's class that this plant is not for the faint of heart. Which is true. I mean, it's just a strange looking plant, but people really like it. Yeah, so. it's I took it as a challenge. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, as you all are plant, planting your planning plan, planting what you're going to plant, um, take something on as a challenge. I think that's a great just rallying cry here for as people look ahead to their homework and you're creating your planting plan and you're creating your plant list. Um, take on something as a challenge. That's a good, that, I love it. Um, so those two things, plus if you want to, and these are optional, put together some photos of those plants. And it kind of helps you think about, you know, what you're doing. And then if you want to get super fancy, you can or organize the photos by bloom. So next week, when we have our class, I'm going to take some of your designs and then we're going to workshop them and talk about them during class. So give us a little bit of time to put that together. So if you put your designs on the Facebook group or on Howe's Garden Web Forum by Friday. I'll have some time to like contact you and get together and then you will appear in class and we'll talk about your garden during class. So um, we'll, I'm going to try to select people that are just have some very different situations so we can go through, you know, clay, sand, sun, shade, all those different permutations and uh, see what, you know, it can be really exciting to see other people's designs. So all you need to post are your before photo, which you've probably already done, your plan, and your plant list. That's that's it. That's all. That's, those are your requirements. So you have your before photo, just like Anna here, her plan, her plant list, and then you're going to be ready to dig and plant, and it's going to grow up and it's going to look great. Looking ahead, we have a. Don't forget that we have a field trip to Wild Type Nursery and it's near Lansing. It's a fantastic native plant nursery. Owner Bill Schneider is going to give us a personal tour and highlight some of the nat native uh, rain garden plants. So look forward to that. Put that on your calendar. The native plant nursery, I just talked to owner Greg Vaklavik and he will be at the Ann Arbor's Farmers Market all through August. Also, he's bringing his entire inventory of native plants to the Mathai Botanical Garden sale. So that's another good place to shop. And in general, if you're looking for native, the straight native Michigan plants, the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association publishes a list, and they're all over the state. Uh, on the west side of the state, there's Hidden Savannah Nursery and Native Connections. 
in central Michigan, there's Michigan Wildflower Farm and Wild Type. And in the Pinky, there's Wetlands Nursery. And in Southeast Michigan, there's the Native Plant Nursery and American Roots, which is in Metro Detroit. So keep that in mind. There's also mail order if those places are not close to you. And these are all good spots to mail order from. And also the Wildflower Association of Michigan, which puts on a great con native plant conference every year. And the Wild Ones, which has chapters all over the state, they have some recommendations for where to get plants as well. So you can always check them out. Wild Ones often has plant swaps as well, and we are hosting a plant swap at uh, Reckon Ed Gardens. And while we're there, we're going to plants. We're going to, you know, have plants giving away book, um, from person to person, and then also we're going to pull a few weeds, as you can see. <laughs> that garden always needs a little bit of lo loving care. But don't feel bad if you just bring if you come empty-handed, because people with full gardens are happy to give plants away. It means they're not going to compost them. It leaves them of guilt, actually, and so and they're happy to <laughs> they're happy to um, have someone to give their plants to. If you're at work, it's time to go back to work. I'm sorry, <laughs> or maybe you know, in celebration of that. Um, if you have questions right now, feel free to chat them in, and we will answer them. But otherwise, thank you, and see you next week, everyone. Hey Susan, could I just have a little um, time, a little time on timing actually, as uh, yeah. since we're later in the summer and mm -hmm. um, it just made me think about it when uh, Greg is going to be uh, selling plants on October 7th. Um, it starts getting a little dicey to plant um, rain garden plants really late in the fall. Um, especially if you have heavy clay soils because you put them in the ground and then they may, your rain garden in the beginning is not going to function as well as it will, you know, a couple of years from now. So if you put in a bunch of little tiny baby bee plants in, um, you know, mid-October and you have heavy clay soils and you have, you know, rain come and fill it up and then it just will sit and can rot those little babies. So if you are have heavy clay soils, I would plant in like no later than mid-September and uh, so you sometimes what people do is dig the rain garden in the fall and then plant it in the spring um, if you have heavy clay soils or, or whatever you know people often will do that that kind of uh, set of timing for themselves for construction so just a little cautionary note on that because I don't want people buying a bunch of plants and then putting them in late and then they all kind of you know drown and rot away uh, over the winter so just think about the the construction timing in that way. So if you have, thing, have yeah, I, okay, oh, you, so if you have heavy clay soils, then you need to buy your plants at Wild Type, dig your garden, buy your plants at Wild Type at the end of August, and plant them during September. Yes. If you have sandy soils, you have it's much more um, uh, flexible. Yeah. And you'd probably want to plant in the fall because then you don't have to water as much next summer. Well, okay. and then what I did, um, because I did buy some stuff at the um, Botanical Garden sale, is I just put them, stuck them in an area that was not part of the rain garden. Right. So I didn't have to worry about them drowning and rotting. That's and a great idea. And they overwinter, put them in the spring. Because, yep. you know, you don't want to pass up a free plant or an inexpensive plant. Yeah. <laughs> The so other just thing, find somewhere else to put them. Yeah, the <laughs> other thing you can do is you don't even necessarily have to put them in the ground. Like if you put them on the north side of your house and you pile a whole bunch of leaves all over them and you sort of insulate them, um, then you can do it that way too. You wouldn't just leave them out without any insulation through the winter um, because they're used to being in the ground. But for, like me, I've had plants sitting around in my yard <laughs> unplanted <laughs> for a while. And um, I have successfully overwintered as long as I pile enough uh, leaves and things like that on them um, in the fall and then put them in in the spring. So these are all good strategies. And we will stick around and answer questions after. Um, so this is the end of our presentation. And I will send everyone an email rem with reminders about the homework. There's no quiz this week. Just focus on your plan. Uh, and good luck and have fun with all your thinking about your plants and your homework this week. Um, so remember, there's one more class. And we will feature you. So um, if I contact you, I hope you're willing to appear in our class. If you're not, that's OK, too. Um, so we are going to stick around and answer some questions. I know that Katie had a question from a little while ago um, that she was um, wanting to bring up, and I was rushing her along. So <laughs> what, what's, what are some questions that have come up, Katie? All right, so the first one is, what are the most common weeds that I will be digging out of my garden? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> oh, wow. It kind of depends on who you've got around you. 
Um, like if you have bindweed, um, oh, geez, good luck. So if you know you have bindweed, then I would just try to get on top of that one as fast as possible. And unfortunately, pulling doesn't seem to help that much. It's like more of an herbiciding situation. So that's a tricky one. It's a lot of the ones that just want to come in and colonize early. Like your typical dandelions, purslane is another really common. Like I've just dug up the ground and it and it wants to um, it wants to take over. It'll just be for a couple of years. It's actually really good for you to eat too, so you can pick it and eat it. Both um, dandelions and purslane, you could eat that whole. That's right. Weed. You could make yourself a salad. Yeah, yep. especially in the spring. Um, what are some other good common weeds out there? Why don't we go around the room? Katie, what are you pulling up these days? You're doing a lot of maintenance. Yeah, yeah. Um, thistle is the biggest one that I've been yes. pulling out. So there's Canada thistle that has a purple flower. Sow thistle has a yellow flower, and it's not quite as pokey. And then there's the worst one is called bull thistle, and it also has a purple flower. It gets huge, and it has big, thick spines on it. Yeah. Um, so that's the one. But it does, if you pull it, um, I've had good success with it not coming back as long as you're pulling and getting most of the roots out. That's hopeful. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> really? Because <laughs> you need body armor for those things. That's the tough part about them. <laughs> That's great. Leslie, what have you been pulling out of your rain garden? Or any of your gardens? Wait, you're, Leslie, you're, you're, you're muted. You're muted. There we go. There okay. You go. Um, let's see, uh, Creeping Charlie from the lawn. Yeah, right. Um, things that have just reseeded from elsewhere, uh, some of which I'll try and dig up and bring to a plant swap, um, like the bottle brush grass, yeah, fox right. sedge. Yeah. Fox sedge is a very good um, filler too, by the way. Um, <laughs> and just the usual thistle, like Katie mentioned as well. Yeah, it's actually some things. Um, I feel like as your garden matures, you end up really weeds, yeah. doing yeah. more um, garden refereeing, where some things want to spread more, <laughs> other things are more um, shy, so they're not spreading as much. So you, I'm always trying to like even the playing field, yeah. and um, yeah. So like when you have those things that are spreading more than you'd like, feel free to bring them to the plant swap. Yeah. But the the other thing to keep in mind with weeding, I think, is it can be intimidating in the beginning to know exactly what is the weed and what is the thing you planted. And so uh, a strategy you can use, um, uh, I know that Bill can actually give you uh, plant tags, um, which are the little like little plastic stake things that go in the ground with your plant. And that's like, oh, right, OK, that's what I'm supposed to keep. So if you plant it with your plant, and if you don't have that with the plant, then you can just put in like a little tongue depressor kind of thing or something to give you some sense that these are the ones that matter. Because I think in this spring, it can be a little like, oh, I don't know what the emerging leaves look like. I mean, that can be sort of intimidating because you're going to, all the pictures on the internet show the big beautiful bloom with the plant that's already three feet tall, not what it looks like when it first emerges in the spring. So having yeah. some sort of system for yourself of what are the plants that stay and, and then it makes it much more clear which are the invaders, especially when you're first getting to know your rain garden. Also, you know, Paw Pop, Michigan, the town, has they have a uh, tag company that makes those little zinc tags that oh, then you can cool. write on, not with Sharpie, Sharpie does not last, but you write on it with a wax pencil and uh, that's a really nice tag and I bought a whole box of them. Like, not, they're not that expensive if you buy a whole bunch of them. And then, it, yeah, I find the same thing that I have to label things, especially the new plants that I'm yeah. not as familiar with, or I forget. That by the yeah. whole, by the next spring, I've forgotten. It all, it all seems so obvious when you put them in the ground. <laughs> and, then, and then later it's like, oh, God, I can't remember. <laughs> or what I end up doing, too, because I'll take a lot of seed heads in the fall and just stick them in the ground. Right. And so it's a matter of what's yeah. coming up. Do I want to keep it or not? So... I'm a compulsive picker, but one thing I really try and do, I mean, it's embarrassing sometimes. I'll just start weeding in people's places. Um, but <laughs> they either really think you're strange or they really like you. Um, but what I try to do is just if I can hold off a little bit um, and wait till they grow a little taller to where it's a little easier to tell, ooh, yeah, yeah what's right. in that cardinal? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Just don't let Ten it go to percent. seed. If it's yeah, <laughs> right. That's the big thing. You can let it go for a while, but 
once you know well, what the flower looks like or whatever, if you let it go to seed, then holy cow, you're making so much more work for yourself. Oh no, I'm not. So. Yeah, I'm not that patient. It doesn't get to flowering. Oh, it looks good. <laughs> Enough so it's got like, four, four leaves. <laughs> All right, I have another question. Um, what are some other good plants that will attract butterflies other than milkweed? Oh, yeah. Um, um, let's see. I have had this year monarchs hanging around the coneflowers and swallowtails. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you like really tall, swallowtails love ironweed. Yeah, they do. But it's a really tall plant, so you probably want to put things in front of it. Um, Joe Pye. Another yep. Yeah. Yep. Wild geranium gets a little butterfly on it too. One of the little woodland native ones does. Um, yeah. What are some other good butterfly ones? You know, look on look on Bill Schneider's website on wild yeah. type because he has a whole list of all those things there, and it really does distill it all down for you. So because there's like the ones where they lay their eggs or the ones where they drink the nectar, there, there's a whole bunch of, you know, different categories that he has. So that's an excellent resource. I would look at that. Also having something that is blooming all through the year. So mm -hmm. starting with shrubs yeah. and going all the way through that, you know, in the very end of the year, we have asters and um, goldenrods and having something blooming all the time that can really help yep. uh, butterflies. Yep. Okay, I have another one, and Leslie, maybe you're the best person for this. Um, <laughs> do you have any trouble transplanting natives because they have such deep roots? Um, it's better to transplant earlier than later. Um, you know, in their life cycle, you know, get them younger. Uh, I will say, though, I tried to move my ironweed, which has been in the ground probably about three, four years now, and I couldn't. I just, I was afraid to dig it up. So it, if you're going to do it, try and do it when they're younger and when yeah. the soil is really, you know, on the wetter side. Yeah. So, yes, those big, those big roots do have a disadvantage. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, we can't hear you. Oh, I have a huge I have a huge ironweed in my tiny garden, and I've been giving parts of it to um, one of the volunteers who has who's maintaining a rain garden in a park. So I keep giving chunks of it to him to Roger Moon, and I've been able to transplant that ironweed. Like now, I've done it like three times. Oh, <laughs> like good. I'll take a big chunk of it and give it to him. And, but it's you know, probably on the great. outer edge, though, right? It's like the newer that's stuff true. on the outer edge yeah. rather than yep. the like, you know, five-year-old stuff that's in the middle. We'll see when I give the whole chunk to you, Shannon. Then I we'll know. Find out. I'm going to do it. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. We'll see if we can dig that sucker out of the ground or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> Get that front end loader that somebody posted on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, right. Or that little bobcat or whatever that was. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Do we have time for any more, Susan? I think um, one more and then we're done. All right, do you have any suggestions, um, again, for sun plants, but ones that are really neat looking and well behaved? Are we talking short? Does that mean short? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, more formal looking, well behaved. Yeah. Um, I think the shrubby sink foil is a pretty good one that Susan went over today because it really does stay in a nice little ball shape, especially if you're not afraid to cut it back in the spring. So that one I think is very neat. Um, and I think some of the shorter switchgrass cultivars, like the Shenandoah switchgrass, only gets to be like three feet tall and that has a very formal, um, just very upright stature. And that one is a good, um, is a good one for full sun too. So those are a couple I thought of. Any others you all? I think Laatris, um, Cobalt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it yep. very neat looking. Leslie, do you have any other? Oh, I'm trying to think. Neat's not usually my goal. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. Let's see. Um, <laughs> the She's cardinal the color. That's right, color. Um, the cardinal flower's a good one, I think. Um, it's taller stays, though, so make sure you put yeah, something. Yeah, it is in front a little taller. Yeah. yeah. The um, let's see. Let's see with color. Can't um, 
I know I'll think of some as soon as we sign off. <laughs> I know, exactly. Right, right, right. That's right. And also, you know, there's that whole list. It is true that the sun plants tend to be taller. So pick mm -hmm. the shorter ones. Pick the shorter mm -hmm. ones. That's mm -hmm. really what it comes down to is short. Yeah. Also, short. The, the shorter the wild blue petunia grows just about everywhere. Ah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. We need to add that to our list, Leslie. I think for the you, firm, you, for you the just firm contributed. Plants. Yeah. yeah. For yeah. the burn plants, I think. Yeah, I, when I bought the first plant, bought some seeds. It was um, basically said, "Oh, for dry areas, it seeds, it will seed anywhere." Huh. So, <laughs> you know, who knows? Well. <laughs> you should just put a couple in the bottom of your rain garden, the wet spot, and tell us if it lives or not. Well, now Susan has seen those little what I call ditches, which yeah. do get wet. They, they their edges, and they seed in the bottom of that. Wow. So, Who knows? Maybe we have a new, a new plant to yeah. add to our list here. That That's right. Cool. And actually, as everyone plants their gardens, if you find things that are not on our list that work and you love, please tell us because we want to add them to our list. All right. I okay. Think, so that's oh, what you know oh, what, Go ahead, Shannon. Thing, and that is, yeah. I think the native iris is really very neat looking too. Oh. Yeah. And so um, I think that's a, a super important one. And then the other thing I think in terms of neat is that um, location matters. The place in your rain garden that you see the most, the kind of front of it, that's where it's really important for things to be super neat looking mm -hmm. if you want it to be neat. And as you move back, you have a lot of leeway, actually. Um, so uh, you just remember that like the way that you see it, you're never looking down on it, right? You're looking at it from a perspective and that I can get away with all kinds of chaos behind some neat plants at the front. Um, uh, so that is another thing to think about in terms of the, the neatness factor because there aren't as many of the, of the straight native species, there aren't as many that are super neat looking. Some of the cultivars are though, you know, so I think that's the other thing is to rely on some of the cultivars like the penstemon that Susan talked about, you know, the Husker Red or the Dark Towers, which is a deeper purpley one, you know, of that. So, or some of the shrubs like the, um, the, the um, Summer Sweet, you know, that's a, another neat one too. So strategy matters a little bit too with the neat thing, I think as well. All right. Well, thank you very much, Leslie, Katie, Shannon, um, for joining us. And thank you all. Of, thank you for lasting through this long conversation about plants. You can tell that we love tech matter. Um, <laughs> and we will see you in two weeks. Next week is optional. We'll be answering questions. Um, and then the last class will be workshopping some of your designs. So good luck with your designs. Thank you. And good afternoon. Bye-bye.